Hello everybody. Welcome to my channel. I am starting a series on crown cutting procedures. I will be discussing first the principles, then the instruments and then the tooth preparation of individual teeth. So let's go ahead and watch. The preparation of the tooth should be such that it should be a miniature form of the original tooth anatomy along with some important features which are incorporated in it to improve its functioning. So what do we want to achieve? The final outcome of tooth preparation should be something like this. This is a molar with a metal crown in place. The crown is cut in a systematic manner. When we do occlusal reduction, we reduce the functional cusp area by around 1.5 mm, the central groove area by 1 mm, and the non-functional cusp by another 1 mm. The axial reduction is done by 1 mm and we give a taper of 2 to 5 degree. Also, I forgot in the functional cusp, we give the functional cusp bevel. The chamfer margin has a depth of 0.5 mm. Now, all this reduction, it is guided by the principles of tooth preparation, which we will be doing further on in our lecture. The principles of tooth preparation form a key in guiding the crown preparation. They include firstly the preservation of tooth structure, then retention and resistance, structural durability, marginal integrity and preservation of periodontium. Preservation of tooth structure. Now this first principle can prove to be a big challenge for the beginner. You see, it is important that in addition to replacing the lost tooth structure, a restoration must preserve the remaining tooth structure. Therefore, the importance of removing only 1 to 1.5 mm of tooth structure during our count cutting procedures. Retention and resistance. You should know that this particular principle determines the success or failure of the restoration. Now, both of them are interrelated and inseparable quantities. We already know that retention means to prevent the removal of restoration along the path of insertion or long axis of the tooth and resistance, it prevents the dislodgement of restoration by apically or obliquely directed forces. Now they are both further dependent on five features. First is taper, then freedom of displacement, path of insertion, length of the preparation, and substitution of internal features. Now let's see what they are. Coming first to taper, we use flat and tapered diamond for this purpose. If you look at the shape of the burr, it is such that as it cuts the tooth surface, it imparts a taper of 2 to 5 degree to the surface. Now you can see it here in the pictures. In the first picture, this is a crown in which the walls they show convergence of 2 to 5 degree and they are being and they are converging occlusally now like this this is occlusal convergence in the second picture we can see the wall they are diverging occlusally 2 to 5 degrees this is inlay preparation like this you can see from here it is diverging and here it is diverging so in the final form the walls of the preparation must taper to permit the restoration to seed. Now this 2 to 5 degree convergence or divergence is known as the concept of taper. Ideally for maximum retention exact parallelism between the walls should be created but this may not be practically possible so slight convergence or divergence is given as the situation demands. Now what does taper do to the walls? You can look at the picture now there are three situations described here. In the first one, the tooth walls have 10 degrees taper, second 15 and the third 20 degree taper. Now this is just an arbitrary situation to explain taper to you. Now taper helps to visualize the prepared walls. This is the first point. Now if you observe, because of the taper, we are able to see the prepared walls better. Then it prevents undercuts because of that, we can move the restoration in and out of the tooth very easily without any hindrance. Then it compensates for the inaccuracies in the fabrication process. Also, the taper permits 
more nearly complete seating of the restoration during cementation. Now what determines the amount of taper given? That means how many degrees taper should we give to the walls? First is the length of the prepared walls. If the walls of the preparation are short, we give less taper. If the walls are longer, we give more taper. Next is the amount of tooth surface involved. If the tooth surface is more involved, we give more taper. Then the need for retention. More the retention needed, less is the taper we give. That means lesser taper gives more retention and near parallel walls would give maximum retention. That means with zero degree taper, the retention would be maximum. Under retention resistance, the next two points we'll discuss is freedom of displacement and path of insertion. Now maximum retention is achieved when there is only one path of insertion. So a full crown preparation with long parallel walls like this and parallel grooves going moving along one path of insertion and getting removed along that path gives the maximum retention. Now in contrast, short over tapered preparation would have less retention because the restoration would be moved along more than one path as you can see it in the picture. Now you see now this restoration can be moved in like this or like this and the preparation is short and it is over tapered as you can see it along the walls. Now whereas path of insertion it should always be parallel to the long axis of the crown and not like this or this. The path of insertion should be straight like this. Coming to length. The occlusal gingival length of a preparation is important in both resistance and retention. Longer preparation has more surface area, therefore is more retentive as compared to a shorter preparation. Coming to the next principle of tooth preparation, it is structural durability. Now you see a restoration must contain a bulk of material that is adequate to withstand the forces of occlusion. If you look at the picture, in the first picture you see that the tooth preparation is less. Therefore, our restoration, that means the crown hair, it is thin. And now this is insufficient to withstand our forces of occlusion. Now compare it with the next picture. Here you can see we have sufficient thickness of the crown present. This is due to proper tooth reduction that has been done. Also, we should make sure that the bulk of the restoration must be confined to the space created by the tooth preparation. To achieve this, we need to do proper occlusal reduction, axial reduction and create a margin. Coming first to occlusal reduction. Now this is one of the most important features for providing adequate bulk of metal to the restoration. In this, the basic inclined plane pattern of the occlusal surface should be duplicated without overshortening the preparation. A flat occlusal surface should be avoided as it overshortens the preparation. You can see the, both the pictures and you can compare the occlusal surfaces of the two. Now functional cusp bevel. Now this is an important part of occlusal reduction. If you see a wide bevel on the functional cusp as seen in the picture is given to provide space for adequate bulk of the metal in the areas of heavy occlusal contact. Now, which are the functional cusps? Buccal cusp for mandibular teeth and lingual cusp for maxillary teeth. Now, the amount of reduction that needs to be done depends upon the material of the crown that we are using. Now, I have given you the values for different material with the amount of reduction that needs to be done on the functional cusp and on the non-functional cusp. You can see it in this table. Coming to axial reduction, now this is also important for securing space for adequate thickness of the impression material. In case there is inadequate axial reduction, we have thin walls and weak restoration. Excess reduction leads to thick walls and bulbous restoration. Now if you look at the picture, you can see in the second picture, excess reduction has been done in this area marked in by red in the cervical portion. Now this excess reduction has led to formation of an undercut.
Therefore, uneven reduction should be avoided and the amount of reduction that is required roughly around 1 mm that should be done. Coming to marginal integrity. Now for the success of restoration in the oral cavity, the margin should be closely adapted to the cavus surface finish line of the preparation. If you look at the picture, you can see that in all these margins, none of the finish line is exposed. They are completely covered by the restoration and they are well adapted. The margin should be as smooth as possible and easily cleansable. Also, they should be placed where they can be duplicated by the impression without tearing or deforming the impression when it is removed. Coming to our last principle, that's preservation of periodontium. Now, this is very important. You see, closest to the gingiva is present our finish line of the tooth. So, to preserve the periodontium, it is very important that our finish line is placed in enamel and also it should be placed supragingivally whenever possible. Now the restoration in the picture is given in the second premolar that is here. You can see how well this, how smoothly the margins are adapted and how well the transition is there between the tooth and the gingiva. I hope you enjoyed this basic introductory lecture. Do like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.